there aren't a lot of obese centenarians. Certainly the muscle mass, I think, from an aging perspective is more important than doing the cardio. But uh, when you look at the studies, then uh, the higher cardiorespiratory fitness is associated with a lower risk of mortality than muscle strength and muscle mass. Seamland, welcome back to the show. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, so we were just saying before we press record, it's it's been a while, um, and we've had you on a couple of times, but it's been it's been a long time. It's great to have you back on, mate. And uh, to jump into your new book, which I know you you said you're just finishing up, and um, I'm, I'm guessing that'll be released at some point this year, and that is the the longevity leap. So I'm really excited about that. So I'm curious. Uh, what got you interested in focusing on uh, aging and longevity in, in the first place? Yeah, so I got into health as a thing when I was around 18, I think. So like after high school, I, I was uh, preparing to enroll in the military in Estonia. And during that summer, I, you know, started to focus a lot on my fitness Mm. wanted wanted to you know obviously prepare for the military but also just uh get like super fit i wanted to win like one of the titles in the military where you get the physical prepares test max scores <laughs> on all the three tests um yeah. i didn't win it at that time i got like i got max scores in push-ups and sit-ups but i didn't get the max score in the running <laughs> test um funny enough you know when we had two years ago we had the military reserve meeting uh, we just like just you know every every few years they bring back the people to uh, memorize things and uh, there I did got the max scores so I've gotten over ten years I've gotten fitter <laughs> which is good um, but yeah I pretty much <laughs> but pretty much I got interested in uh, fitness and wanted to optimize it um, mm-hmm. did a lot of exercise and stuff like that you know focused on a lot of like basics of nutrition after the military I went to the uni. And uh, started learning anthropology, which uh, which is something I was interested in because of being interested in humans human, humans as a species overall. You know, I was interested in a lot of like ancient civilizations and uh, hunter gatherers and uh, those kind of things. And uh, I just wanted to yeah like learn about humans. It was more of like a, I didn't have a plan to become an anthropologist or like a you know, ethnographer, which most anthropologists would do, they would write ethnographies about different people, but I would uh, do it as a way to just like, you know, self-development for myself and to learn about things. There I just also was, you know, advancing my knowledge in health and nutrition as well. Mm-hmm. I continued exercising, learned about different ways of dieting, intermittent fasting, and those kind of things. And uh, at, at one point, I wanted to focus more on longevity because like my you know grandfather died uh, to a colorectal cancer when he was 36 years old mm. which is you know super young and I wasn't born then my mother was like 8 years old or something so yeah it was obviously something that I didn't want to like repeat in my family lineage and uh, the biggest or the most important part for any kind of chronic disease whether that be heart disease neurodegeneration cancer and those kind of things is you know prevent prevention and living in a healthy uh, lifestyle of course there's some genetic aspects as well but uh, they can all be like you know prevented with the proper lifestyle so that that's why i wanted to you know obviously take care of my own longevity and uh, mm-hmm. started to learn about those things as well of how can i make sure that i don't die prematurely um, myself because i don't have like you know good longevity genetics no one in my family I don't know of anyone who has lived over the age of 80. So they're all mostly dying in their 70s, mm-hmm. uh, which, um, you know, I'm hoping I can like break at some uh, point this curse kind of. Um, and uh, another reason why, I, you know, specifically wanted to create content about longevity and write books about it and really go into it was also because of the anthropolog- anthropological side. So uh, obviously aging and longevity is something humans have been thinking about since our, you know, throughout our history, ever since we were hunter gatherers, we've been thinking about death and living a long time and stuff like that. So it's just as an anthropologist, I'm also interested in the 
the like philosophical and anthropological side of longevity of um you know figuring out one of the hardest problems <laughs> humans have been thinking about throughout our uh, history and you know when we're talking about obesity or heart disease even and uh, other like chronic diseases then we pretty much know you know what needs to be done and we have like pretty reliable medicines as well to postpone those diseases you know like the lifestyle adjustments that need to be made you know the, and and with those chronic diseases it's mostly about like adherence and uh, sticking to the routines but with longevity and aging we don't have you know the complete picture yet we don't mm. we haven't like you know repeatedly extended lifespan even in like animal uh, models and not to mention humans and it's of course much harder to do it in humans as well and i'm just yeah for myself doing it for my own longevity <laughs> to uh you know improve my own health and the chances of living longer and uh as a human human you know specimen kind of uh, i'm doing it as a you know quest of uh, you know science or anthropology as mm. well <laughs> I like it man i like it great great story in on to in getting the understanding of why you're so passionate about it what, what i like is if you think about we live in a very toxic environment very toxic world and you know there's a lot out there on just trying to be healthy right how do you just stay healthy with all these toxins going around and you know detoxing and uh, eating well but i like when we're thinking about longevity and aging gracefully it's like we're playing to win it's like well yeah i get all that that's all there but i'm gonna tackle that and also i'm aiming to last 100 plus so i, I like that mindset your book is called The Longevity Leap. What What is The Longevity Leap? Yeah, so The Longevity Leap, the title is inspired by a study where they discussed that currently there's like a 10-year gap between the average lifespan or life expectancy in the world and health-adjusted life expectancy, which is like mm. the life free from these chronic diseases. So the average age at which a person gets a comorbidity like hypertension, heart disease or cancer or something else is like 63. And the average global life expectancy in 2020 at least was 73.3 mm -hmm. uh, years. So it's you know slightly increasing every year, um, be but most of it is because of the reduction in infant mortality in developed or developing uh, countries and have access to better healthcare and stuff like that. So it's not that humans are exponentially living longer. It's just that you know the average life expectancy is calculated. Yeah, it's like an average across the entire population and across the entire globe. So the developing countries are dragging the average life expectancy down, not in a bad way, but you know it's it's the unfortunate situation. Whereas you know the average life expectancy in countries like South Korea or Japan and Spain, Italy. Hong Kong, uh, Monaco, those have an uh, average life expectancy over 80 years. Uh, so, you know, and but the, but the study mentioned that, you know, there's this gap, 10 year gap between the health span, which is the lifespan free of disease and the actual maximum or the average life expectancy. So the uh, title of the book or the idea is to bridge that gap mm. to extend the health span because you know once you do that you not only have better quality of life you have more years uh, free from disease that reduce your quality of life but also in so doing you delay the other chronic diseases like heart disease and neurodegeneration and in so doing you like add healthy years to your life as well because you know what's what really is one of the biggest determining factors to how long an average person lives is when do they get a particular chronic disease like heart disease or kidney disease or alzheimer's or cancer right. and what they find with centenarians is that the people who live over 100 years old they they're not like immune to these diseases they get the same diseases but they just get heart disease or cancer 10 years later or 20 years later than the average person so they're just either genetically luckier that uh, they get a disease slightly later or they have some other like environmental factors like yeah they live on an island uh, in uh, sardinia or something like that that is very natural environment uh 
or they do like follow some healthy lifestyle habits as well. You know, what, what you find from the centenarian studies is that they don't have some sort of a super optimized biohacker health routine. <laughs> they they actually have like a very, you know, decent of a health routine. Like they don't, they don't drink a bunch of alcohol, but they do drink some alcohol. They uh, eat mostly whole foods, but not like a very, you know, pristine diet. They you know, eat some, let's say, sweets as well every once in a while. They don't have a lot of like processed food, like uh, donuts and those kind of things. But they do still, you know, they're not like a very, they don't have like some sort of a, a vegan biker, grass-fed uh, diet. <laughs> well, of yeah. course, maybe they do have grass-fed meat, but uh, the point is that they don't have some sort of a very, like, you know, they don't have any of these routines that a lot of the longevity people in the space uh, have. But they do have good genetics, apparently, and they do have mm. in favorable environmental factors, and they do have things like community and low stress and uh, physical activity in their life. They don't go to the gym, but uh, they do maintain regular physical activity, like walking up and down the hills and uh, walking around everywhere, spending time in nature and outside and uh, those kind of things. So taking a longevity leap means bridging the gap between your health span and lifespan so that you have more quality years in your life but in so doing, you also take a leap forward with your average life expectancy that you add extra years to your life as well, which is you know, possible because uh, you uh, delay the onset of these uh, chronic diseases. So that's the like, main aim of the book or the main knowledge in the book is centered around, okay, how do you prevent the top killers in the world, which are you know, heart disease, mm. neurodegeneration, kidney disease, diabetes in developing or developed countries. In developing countries, they have more these infectious diseases, but they start to catch up as well with the advancements in healthcare in those uh, countries. Yeah. I like what you're saying. And, you know, I think we all want to live a long time. And actually, when we live a long time, we just want to be, you know, unwell right at the very end versus what's going on now. You know, obviously the average is a 10 year gap, but if you go to some of the more westernized countries like the US, I'm sure it's a lot longer, right? A lot wider. And I liked what you said. If we can get as far as we can until, you know, the health span fails, that is a kind of proxy to live longer, right? And to, and to have a, a longer life. Have you, um, have you come across a, a lady called Mary Ruddock and her work? Have you heard of Mary? Uh, no. She is, um, she's a practitioner that she's always going all over the world. She's been on the show a couple of times, but she's lived in Icaria in Greece and she studied all of these blue zones. And it's fascinating when she gives her interpretation of what's going on. She talks about how they eat like nose to tail. They eat all of the animal. Nothing goes to waste. Uh, there's a real sense of community um, within, you know, the, 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 the centenarians are still doing things. They still have purpose. They still get up and have to do stuff. So it was, it was fascinating, fascinating getting her take and it aligns with what you're saying around, yes, diet's important, but there's so many other factors, community. It's not necessarily about eating the, the cleanest diets, right? There's so many different factors. There's genetics, there's overall pollution. Um, but yeah, I would love to go to one of these blue zones because I know a lot of them technically... I, t I think I, I read there's only really one left now technically but mm. there's obviously little bubbles of communities in those areas but yeah it's it's fascinating isn't it to see why those individuals are you know living so long right and way over 100 years old i think it's fascinating stuff mm. so you obviously have the book coming out and uh we're looking forward to that dropping and uh i want to jump into now your four-step routine that you've developed to maximize longevity to maximize your health span and you know would love to get your take on how you do that so the first one here is you talk about maintaining optimal body composition why why is that important yeah so the fact of the matter is that there aren't a lot of obese centenarians or <laughs> mm -hmm. there's not a lot of uh, you know overweight people living a very long time and uh, obesity and even having 
the wrong type of extra body fat, which is the visceral fat, then that does you know contribute to pretty much all the chronic diseases as well. It's one of the main like lifestyle related issues to heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, mm. uh, cancer, and neurodegeneration. So uh, yeah, even like metabolically healthy obesity, which is has been used around pa- over the past few years, mm. is not really a thing <laughs> because the uh, the higher your BMI, then generally all the components of metabolic syndrome and metabolic dysfunction also increase mm. with the increase in BMI. So the more overweight you are, generally, then um, the worse your biomarkers are going to be. Of course, there are some exceptions. Some people develop insulin resistance and diabetes at a lower BMI compared to others. It's called the body fat set point. But uh, yeah, like there's just no health benefits to having excess or you know very large amounts of excess uh, body fat. You know, the the only difference is that there's a difference between men and women. So uh, women appear to get away with a lot of things that men can't get away with. That's why 90% of centenarians are women. And, uh, you know, some scientists think that it's maybe related to estrogen. It might be related to other these uh, sex hormones that women have. And it could also be related to that, you know, men are more, they take more risky behavior. They take or they follow unhealthier habits and those kind of things as well. But even physiologically, there are some like sex hormone differences that uh, can skew the distribution of centenarians, making the women on average live like, you know, five to 10 years longer than men on average, Mm -hmm. even before centenarianhood. And uh, if you are a woman and your BMI is like, you know, 35, then even then you you don't see like a very significant increase in risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas if you're a man and you're overweight, then uh, the risk pretty much increases linearly with increasing body fat uh, percentages. So as a man, you pretty have, if you want to become a centenarian, then you pretty much have to have a very healthy lifestyle and you have to have a very good, you know, body composition and uh, healthy biomarkers uh, pretty much uh, as long as possible. And uh, obesity and being overweight are one of the, you know, let's say contributors to bad composition, bad, bad body composition. Mm-hmm. The other part of body composition is also muscle mass and lean tissue. So uh, low amounts of muscle mass is also a risk factor for a lot of different chronic diseases. Sarcopenia is this medical condition where you are with low muscle strength, low muscle mass, and with poor p- physical performance. Mm-hmm. So uh, th- that increases your risk of all cause mortality by up to like 100% in the elderly people. So if you're an older person, you don't have muscle strength and muscle mass, then you're very frail and uh, you're at a higher risk of like hip fractures and other like falling down. And, you know, one of the biggest causes of death among the elderly is falling down and the subsequent consequences that they experience uh, from that. Muscle mass is also beneficial for protecting against obesity in some way. Like if you have more muscle mass, then your metabolic rest your resting metabolic rate is going to be higher it's going to be easier for you to burn calories and stay leaner and it also is a very large glucose disposal uh, vessel (laughs) in in that sense because if you have more muscle tissue then your body is better able to metabolize glucose without causing insulin resistance or without leading to insulin resistance and poor metabolic health so yeah muscle mass and and body fat they both contribute to optimal body composition you know bone density is also there but if you have more muscle then you generally have to have you you will have generally higher bone density as well so the goal is to have you know higher muscle mass lower body fat and higher bone density there's obviously Mm -hmm. a range to that you don't need to be elite in terms of uh muscle mass like you know there's definitely something uh, or there's definitely too much muscle mass that can also have negative side effects or you know d- dimin- diminishing returns. The same with body fat percentage. If you're too lean, then that can have diminishing returns, especially if you're like in the elderly group. So uh, being too skinny or malnourished also increases risk of frailty in the elderly people. So if you're a young person, then it's better to have you know pretty low amounts of body fat and more muscle mass. And if you're older then uh, 
having slightly more body fat is, is protective because it protects against you know falls and uh, frailty. And but ideally, you still want to have uh, relatively speaking higher amounts of uh, muscle mass for your age group. Like you want to have slightly more or slightly above average for your age group uh, when it comes mm. to uh, muscle mass. And uh, there are like clinical def- like this uh, criteria as well for sarcopenia, which uh, you know, like I said, low muscle mass and low muscle strength and poor physical performance. For the muscle mass, you can do, you know, you would need to do like a DEXA scan, which is the gold standard for measuring body composition. It's going to tell you your bone density, mu- uh, muscle mass, and body fat percentage. And the DEXA scan calculates your appendicular lean mass. And uh, then if your appendicular lean mass index, which is the appendicular lean mass divided by your, the square of your height, then uh, if that for men is below 7, then that's categorized as sarcopenia and 5.5. Uh, is for women, uh, so you want to be above that. And Got it. you know, for me, thirty years old, my my appendicular lean mass last time I measured was eight point nine, which put me into the ninetieth, or which put me in like the ninth more than ninety percent of people of my age group. So I'm in like the pretty higher end, and I want to like maintain it. So like around eight would be a ninety percentile for the age of, let's say seventy or. Uh, 75 or 80 even because you do see a decline in muscle mass uh, with age because of the like natural aging process and also like this worsening of the ability to build muscle or or maintain it so that's why it's important to stay ahead of the curve in terms of your muscle mass and muscle strength because all of these things go down with age your muscle mass goes down with age about about 10 percent per decade muscle strength goes about down by about 10% per decade, VO2 max goes down and, you know, all those things go down with age. So you never want to play catch up, you know, when, when you see that, oh, oh, I'm actually pretty low on this um, borderline sarcopenia, then it's, you know, actually pretty, it depends on what your age is. Like if you find that you have sarcopenia in your 30s, then you have still plenty of time to turn it around. If you're in your 70s and 80s and you find um, in the sarcopenia range, then, you know, your life is going to be much more difficult and uh, your risk of mortality is also uh, much higher uh, because of that got it so basically we need to be you know shed the fat build the muscle and that that's a key indicator of of longevity which i which i like yeah and one of the like contrapoints a lot of people bring out is that hey you know the centenarians none of them lift they i've never seen a muscular centenarian before yeah. uh, which is true but that's not that's not what we're talking about so if you look at a group of people you have you know 10 people and then you see and then you do a dexa scan on all of them then you find that okay the people who are in the 90th percentile of muscle mass the ones who have the most muscle mass they're generally going and, and then you follow them up for you know multiple years then you see that okay the ones who had the most muscle generally had the lowest risk of mortality as well so it's not that building muscle per se is what like is not what is the kind of key to this the the key is that the people who have slightly more muscle generally have lower rates of mortality and it doesn't matter how they achieve that you're not going to able to like replicate it to the same way that they do but you can the only thing that you can do is that okay i'm trying to fit myself into that same paradigm of body composition and other biomarkers because that what apparently works through like almost like natural selection like okay you see what kind of traits and what kind of qualities what kind of markers uh, what ranges of markers are linked to the lowest mortality and then you try to emulate it so that you would fit into the same category as well hopefully so it's uh kind of like placing your bets on the most reasonable and most likely beneficial outcome yeah so really i think about if you're you know if you are a centenarian in the blue zones, you'll just be active. You'll be moving. You'll be outdoors lifting stuff, and that will be maintaining muscle mass, right? And right. keeping fat off. So yeah, it's right. They're not lifting in the gym. They're not like trying to bulk or anything like that. But they are doing yeah. things to maintain uh, low fat composition and and good and good muscle as well. Yeah. Okay. So next up, you talk about calorie restriction. So we've we've heard of this before, int- intermittent fasting and um 
you know, I've seen there's there's a definite correlation between, you know, the amount of calories you eat and how long uh, that you live. So how do you implement this in, in what you do and how can calorie restriction help us improve our, our lifespan or health span rather? Yeah, so the idea of calorie restriction improving longevity and lifespan comes mostly from animal studies is one of the most replicated methods of extending lifespan in animals, in different animals, mice, rats, uh, yeast, uh, monkeys even. Mm -hmm. And um, there are you know, a lot of mechanisms as well that can explain this phenomenon. Obviously, in humans, the story is a lot more complicated. We don't have long-term data about calorie restriction extending, extending human lifespan because it would be like pretty impossible to do that kind of a study, a lifelong study, because uh, you know humans live very long, and it's very imp difficult to track those kind of things or control for all the va variables. Whereas in animal studies or these lab animals, you can control exactly how many calories and what movement they do and those kind of things. Uh, but you know, still, regardless, in animal studies, calorie restriction does extend uh, lifespan. Not always, but you know, pretty consistently. And uh, in humans, we do have like a few short-term randomized control trials lasting like two years. They're called like the calorie uh, trials done by the National Institute of Aging. And they have found that if they tell, okay, the randomized people into these groups, one of them is uh, prescribed, one of the groups is prescribed to be on a calorie deficit of about 25% uh, for the next two years. And the other is like a more control group. What they find is that after those two years, mm -hmm. first of all, none of the people in the calorie restriction group are able to actually adhere to the calorie deficit. So they end up eating around only like 15% calorie deficit or 10%, something like that depends on the person. So they're not able to adhere to it because it's pretty hard to eat, you know, 25% fewer calories mm -hmm. for the rest of their life. And for the record, like those people aren't actually like counting counting their calories. They're not measuring their food and those kind of things. So you don't necessarily know if they actually were in a calorie deficit. But regardless, you know, that's the best we got <laughs> in terms of doing long term uh, randomized control trials in humans. And but what you do find is that even even then, the people who do the calorie restriction or who, who are said to do it, uh, those people after those two years generally have slightly lower body weight slightly better cardiometabolic risk factors like blood pressure, blood sugar, lipids, inflammation, and visceral fat, and those kind of things. So their, their health does improve if you do tell them to eat slightly less calories, even if that what they adhere to is only 15%. You know, if they were to adhere to the 25% precisely, then the results could be better. Uh, but, you know, we don't have the, we don't have the exact control over everything they do but uh, in human trials it does appear that calorie restriction does improve markers of health it improves body comp body composition through the perspective of uh, body fat loss and weight loss uh, not necessarily muscle gain uh, as a like sole intervention but uh, you do see improvements in health and as of now it's you know hard to say that it's it, there's no evidence that eating 25% fewer calories is going to extend your lifespan in humans. But it's certainly what it does do is reduce the risk of chronic diseases because your metabolic health and your biomarkers improve. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into the development of diabetes and heart disease. But if you're not overweight and your, you know, biomarkers like lipids, triglycerides, blood pressure, blood sugar, insulin, those things are better and improving than your risk of the chronic diseases also goes down. So it's just a method of like taking the leap kind of from a dietary perspective that you're slowing down the development of these uh, chronic uh, diseases yeah. uh, slightly. And it, I guess, yeah, like the issue here is also that it depends on your age so if um, you're someone who is like, again, like 70s or 80s, then uh, your risk of m malnutrition and frailty, I think, outweighs a lot of the benefits of yeah. the calorie restriction. So if you're 
older person, you're already sarcopenic, you have low muscle tone, low bone density, then you're already probably doing calorie restriction because <laughs> you're suffering the consequences of excess calorie restriction by having low muscle mass. And in that scenario, it's actually important to eat more, like to prevent further uh, degradation and further frailty. So it depends what age you're at. You know, the main idea is to yeah, just not become obese. And, uh, you know, you can achieve that probably with like the maintenance calories. You don't necessarily need to be in a calorie deficit. Maybe you can achieve it by just being in a calorie maintenance. Uh, but if you were to also like believe in the idea that some of the mechanisms that calorie restriction works by also has longevity benefits, then, uh, yeah, like just being in some sort of, um, you know, lower body fat state could have some longevity benefits as well. But there's no evidence that the only thing right now is that calorie restriction is going to reduce your risk of becoming overweight and um, developing these other chronic diseases. Mm. Yeah, there's so many variables to it, right? As you said, you know, what's your age, uh, gender, there's all these different elements to calorie restriction, right? But for the average person, young person, relatively healthy, interested in health uh, and longevity. What are some general strategy, strategies that they can implement? And also, what, what do you implement yourself in regards to calorie restriction? And again, trying to get, keep this longevity uh, narrative throughout what you do with your, your health regimes. Yeah, so I do eat like a lower calorie diet. Um, my metabolic rate is pretty high. But I'm still, you know, obviously staying lean year round, which would require me to not overeat calories. Because if I were to eat, overeat calories all the time, then I would just gain body fat. And, you know, if you don't have abs, then you probably are eating slightly more calories than, <laughs> than your body requires. And um, what I do is, you know, obviously I have, it's important to keep exercising and keep doing resistance training to build muscle tissue. and what my, yeah, like, let's say, goal post or what my anchor for this is, yeah, I'm just looking at my body composition. Mm -hmm. Am I starting to get too overweight? Am I starting to, is my waist circumference increasing? Is my body fat percentage increasing? And then I'm just adjusting my calorie intake based on that. On an everyday basis, I'm just eating, like, according to my energy requirements. So if I exercise, then I'm just eating more calories. If I don't exercise, then I'm eating less calories because I'm burning fewer calories as well. So yeah, it just comes down to my energy expenditure and what my goals are. Some parts of the year, I am trying to kind of, quote unquote bulk and try to add more muscle because it's going to be virtually impossible to do it in a calorie deficit all the time unless you're overweight or obese. But if you're already lean and you want to add a bit more muscle tissue, then you do need to be in a calorie surplus to a certain extent and eat mm -hmm. sufficient amounts of protein. So like maybe some parts of the year maybe like a few weeks or a month or two, I am trying to add a little bit of mass, muscle mass, but at other times I'm pretty much around maintenance and eating according to my like exercise uh, demands, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you do a restricted feeding window? So do you do intermittent fasting? Uh, yeah, I do a more narrower intermittent fasting window. And, uh, you know, there's different, in the book I talk about fasting as well, it's not superior to calorie restriction or a lot of the health benefits of intermittent fasting come from the calorie restriction. So uh, you can't like neglect the calorie intake <laughs> when you are doing intermittent fasting. And, uh, you know, calorie restriction apparently is the key variable in the studies where intermittent fasting extends lifespan in animals as well. So without calorie restriction or without staying lean and staying in a good body composition, the intermittent fasting wouldn't have life extension effects. You might mitigate some of the harm, but you know you need to stay uh, normal with your calorie intake as well when you are doing intermittent fasting. And mm -hmm. you know there's many opinions about what's the best window. It doesn't really matter. It's more of like a tool to adhere to the calorie uh, deficit. So you use the intermittent fasting window to okay, I'm going to eat only in these hours, mm -hmm. and at that time, so that my diet is more successful and easier to adhere to. So uh, for me, it's not hard to be in a calorie deficit, but I'm doing the intermittent fasting because it's also like helpful from a productivity side for me. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll just, in the morning, I'm not going to eat anything until like 11 a.m. Then I'll have a protein shake before my workout. I'll drink the protein shake, maybe a piece of fruit before the workout. And then I'll go to the gym. A few hours after the gym, I'll uh, have my dinner. And that's uh, pretty much it. Yeah. How I, that's how I do it. Like you can also, you know, do it in other ways. You can do it with three meals a day. You know, what I what I do think is that like a good rule of thumb also is to just not eat immediately after waking up and not eat immediately before bed. So if you do that already, then you achieve pretty much most of the benefits from intermittent fasting. So you don't need yeah. to do any like one meal a day or you don't need to do the warrior diet or anything like that. It's uh it's just, you know, from a circadian perspective, you do want to like narrow your eating window slightly, but you don't need to take it to like a very tight window. So like the smaller the window is, the more benefits. Uh, or gotcha. There's there's nothing like that. <laughs> you don't get more benefits by having a smaller uh, window because mm -hmm. the calories is what matters uh, more. Yeah. I actually, I just came off doing a 48 hour fast. Mm. And what was really interesting um, Day one's always a bit tough, right? You think, oh, you kind of miss food, and it's the you get it's the emotional attachment I find. And the second day is always is super easy. And I actually yesterday I had two or three different podcasts, either being interviewed myself or interviewing, and I was just on fire. Like my brain was just because again, my I, I checked my ketones; it was like three point five, mm. and I was like, so I was just, I was just in another zone. It was so good. Um, but again, it, you know, to get to that level of ketosis, you've got to be fasting for a while. So, yeah, lo loads of benefits of of intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting, um, including, as you said, the cognitive benefits for sure. Yeah, but uh, with the extended fasting, yeah, there's no evidence that doing three, you know, five, seven, ten day fasts would extend your lifespan. <laughs> we don't we don't yeah. have that even in animals. Uh, so yeah, it's you know. It's not, definitely not something that is needed to do. Uh, yeah. But if you like it, and you know there are obviously some benefits, you lose a lot of weight, you might get some inflammation down, and those kind of things. If you are an older person, then obviously it's not a good idea to do it because you're going to lose a lot of muscle and mm -hmm. increase the risk of frailty. But if you're young, then you can yeah, definitely get away with it and can be a you know if you don't like to be in a calorie deficit all the time, then you can yeah just do once a week you do a forty eight hour fast and that puts you into a pretty steep calorie deficit for the week. So it's not the day of the calorie deficit matters, you know, the calorie deficit matters over the course of weeks and the months and the years. Yeah. No, I, I did it half for a challenge and you know, I, I like to do at least a twenty four hour fast at least once a month. And I thought, you know what, I'll go two days. And it was it was tough, you know, but I'm glad I got through it. And um yeah, it was good to refeed. Okay. So the next one is uh, is around the foods that you eat. And um, obviously we know things like ultra processed food is, isn't great, but tell us, tell us about your thoughts on, you know, extending longevity. What food should we focus on? What food should we avoid? Um, serving sizes, all of that. What are, what are your recommendations there? Yeah, so food is something that, like we talked earlier, Mm. many people think that it's the thing uh, for longevity <laughs> based on the blue zones and i think you know animal studies and those kind of things as well is that the f food obviously matters a lot in determining your biomarkers and health status there are some diets that improve your biomarker or are more likely to improve your biomarkers than others there are like some like key aspects of nutrition that you need to hit like your micronutrients and mm and sufficient amount of protein and uh, essential fatty acids and those kind of things. But uh, other than that, there's no like gold standard diet for longevity. If you look at the people who live over the over 100, 100 years, they'll, you know, they'll eat ice cream every night, they'll smoke, oh, they'll wow. eat chocolate, uh, those kind of things. So it's, it's, uh, it's not that food doesn't matter. It's just that food has less of an impact than the good Comp body composition and having the biomarkers so food is just a m means to an end of having the good body composition and good micronutrient status and and uh, good biomarkers like the ones we talked about inflammation blood sugar lipids blood pressure those kind of things and some diets help you to achieve it better uh, than others so if you eat only twinkies and donuts 
then yes, less light over the course of some time, eventually over the course of decades, probably you will have slightly less muscle because you're not getting enough protein. You might have slightly extra body fat because you're more likely to eat more calories versus if you're eating more whole foods diet that has sufficient amounts of protein and uh, other foods, then you're more likely to have a good body composition and more likely to have good biomarkers. But it's, you know, you, you can only diet yourself to uh, longevity. You also need to have the other aspects as well, like exercise and sunlight exposure, sleep and, and those kind of things. With that being said, okay, what are the foods that I do think are important? So first of all, like you said, you know, having a more, less ultra-processed food diet is generally healthier. Mm-hmm. So, but ultra processed doesn't mean that all uh, like ultra processed foods are bad. Some processed foods are actually associated with better health outcomes. Like you know, olive oil is processed. Some dairy foods are processed. Uh, so it's not that the processing itself is bad. It's just how you do it, and you know what's the final outcome mm-hmm. <laughs> in humans. So if you process foods like refined carbohydrates and make donuts and those kind of things, then generally that's going to be associated with worse outcomes compared to uh, processing things like olive oil or whatever other healthy processed food there is. But as a rule of thumb, it's beneficial to focus on whole foods, kind of single ingredient foods. Uh, that's going to make it much easier, but uh, it doesn't mean that you can't have some, let's say, less optimal foods uh, there. So like I said, there's the centenarians and you know most people don't have this pristine Mm-hmm. Uh, biohacker healthy uh, diet so to say i think you know if you're getting you have to also keep in mind the stress part if you're like super stressed out about the diet you're worried about all the different ingredients then that mental stress can actually do more harm than yeah. than avoiding the whatever ingredient it is and you know if mm-hmm. at mediterranean countries they drink wine they stay up late <laughs> like if you go to sicily or something they all all the locals, they actually come out at like 9 p.m. and walk the pier and walk around under blue light. They eat the sweets, the whatever it is, but they still have a pretty high life expectancy compared to the U.S. or some other developed uh, countries. So there's some things that are apparently more important or there are some things that m- might help you to get away with a suboptimal diet, which I think are like, you know, movement, walking, social connection, stress-free lifestyle, sleeping enough and uh, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Now to answer your question, <laughs> finally, what are the good foods? I think if you want to like, if you want to be safe on the safe side, then based on the research, then like the Mediterranean diet is generally associated with you know healthier outcomes pretty repeatedly, and uh, you know what it is is just eating uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, beans, fish, some meat, eggs, dairy, and uh, moderate amounts of uh, wine and those kind of things so that's that's pretty much i think the most evidence-based healthiest diet out there of course you can adjust it slightly you can have more animal-based more plant-based whatever more dairy-based whatever it is uh, but uh, that's kind of the main kind of framework and some of the controversy is that you know mediterranean people they don't follow that diet like they're actually eating a lot of pork or whatever well of course the mediterranean region is very large Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know you have millions of people there um, several countries of course they eat differently in different regions so what your grandma in sicily ate is not you know of course you know it might be beneficial from your genetic standpoint but you have to realize that that might not apply, apply to the entire population and there's also different other variables that uh, play there and but the, the most of the studies are done on the clinical mediterranean diet which uh, actually has you know these specific food recommendations and quantities and how much should you moderate these other foods and those kind of things yeah. so if you want to really you know minimize your risk of heart disease mostly and neurodegener- neurodegeneration then uh, the clinical mediterranean diet is the most evidence based out of uh, all of them and but of course that's not it might not be the only one you know the most important part is yeah that you track your blood work and uh, maintain a good body composition i think that's the most yeah. that's the way that's the magic through which the diet works <laughs> by keeping your body composition uh, good and uh keeping your biomarkers also um good yeah 
what's interesting is all, all of these different variables they all interlink right and yeah diet can be really confusing and and there's 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 diets for every day of the week nowadays but we mm. all know the mediterranean diet and clearly off the, based off the data it sounds like it's something that um you know if we're, if we're aiming for that longevity piece sounds like it's it's something to to aim towards uh, the last points that you've got on your four steps is physical exercise. So again, we kind of know this, right? We understand we need to, to to get moving. But how does that relate to longevity? And again, what specific things would you recommend people do uh, in order to maintain or to have a good physical exercise routine to extend longevity? Yeah, so exercise, you know, we've talked already. It's a pretty important uh you know the longest living people they don't go to the gym <laughs> they don't do marathons and those kind of things so you can definitely do too much exercise as well but you do need to maintain some aspect of physical movement for the rest of your life uh you know mm. whether that be walking gardening hiking doing some sort of physical movement and uh, maintaining yeah the kind of physical robustness because uh you can't maintain sufficient amount of muscle mass with diet alone you need to have the stimulus as well that signals the muscles and your bones that hey you need to grow uh, to maintain higher higher muscle mass and uh, bone density so once you mm -hmm. stop that then uh, that's where your speed of aging also increases mm -hmm. because of your becoming more frail and uh, losing like the functional functionality over time so that's why you know the biggest reason why you should exercise is that you should you want to maintain just the ability to move <laughs> in your later yeah. years and to maintain um, you know the muscle strength and they do find that if you have low grip strength then even like decades later you can predict how well are you able to get off a chair or put on clothes if you have yeah. low grip strength in your 40s then you're going to have like two to three times more difficulty or you're more likely to two to three times more likely to experience difficulty putting on clothes. So uh, it's just a s reflection of how functional is your body. And uh, with age, that unfortunately goes uh, down. So the only way to do that, unless you are living in a like a island and you grow your, your food and doing physical labor uh, pretty regularly, unless you do that, <laughs> then you do need to like yeah. emulate it somehow, you know, going to the gym and doing some cardio and those kind of things. If you are living in a very physical environment or you, you have a very physical lifestyle, then of course the requirement for actual recreational exercise is much lower. Uh, but uh, yeah, you need to emulate. Certainly the muscle mass, I think from an aging perspective is more important than doing the cardio. But uh, when you look at the studies, then uh, the higher cardiorespiratory fitness is associated with a lower risk of mortality than muscle strength and muscle mass. So uh, if you look at if you were to put it on a tier list, then at the most top, the most important thing or the or the most effective the, the thing that gives you the biggest results in reducing mortality risk is cardiorespiratory fitness. So that's cardio. Then the second one would be muscle strength. So the, the actual like functionality of your muscles, and uh, the third one would be muscle mass. So the amount of muscle mass is uh, the least important out of the three and uh you can you know for the for the muscle mass and muscle strength you the best way to do increase those is to do some form of resistance training it doesn't have to be any particular form of resistance training it doesn't have to be bodybuilding or powerlifting it can be calisthenics even yoga is a form of resistance training but it's probably not intense enough over the long term so doing some form of resistance training uh, you know, at least a few times a week is enough and uh, recommended for healthy uh, aging. Cardiorespiratory fitness, you can train with low intensity endurance cardio or hit intervals as well. What they do find is that like hit in the short term gives more results in terms of increasing cardiorespiratory fitness and VO2 max but uh, the adaptations tend to be more permanent, so you would need to like keep doing the intervals to maintain that. Whereas with low intensity cardio, the VO two max adaptations are more more uh, permanent. Um, 
when you say it, when you say low intensity cardio, do you mean walking? Like I think low grade. A lot of these centenarians, they'll just walk a lot. They'll just walk around the hills, etc. Um, is that what you mean by the, the low grade? Um, well, walking isn't necessarily cardio. So there's different aerobic zones: zone one to five. Zone one is like max out sprinting. And zone one is, yeah, walking and slight incline, but not like mountaineering. Zone two would be, yeah, like jogging and uh, perhaps, yeah, mountain, mountaineering to a certain extent. And zone three and four are, you know, somewhere in, do it, in between there. Got it. So zone one, you know, you would have to do a lot of it to get a sufficient response. You would probably have to do like several hours a day to... You, you can probably certainly maintain a good baseline with that by just staying physically active. But if you want to yeah, increase your VO2max more or faster, then uh, doing zone two is what lays the foundation to your cardiovascular fitness and uh, gives the most long-term adaptations as well. Uh, whereas with HIT, you're getting sh uh, faster results and in a more time-efficient manner, but uh, the, the adaptations tend to be uh, less uh, permanent. As well, mm. you know, I I think you should, you know, everyone should do a mix of both, mm -hmm. you know, at least once a week of some interval workout, and uh, you know, at least once a week some zone two cardio as well. Uh, if you want to really optimize it, then the protocol would be like three times a week for resistance training, thirty to forty five minutes each workout, and uh, one interval workout. I'll, I, I can share what's the best protocol shortly, but one interval workout per week and then two zone two cardio sessions per week for like 45 to 60 minutes. You know, the, generally like the more moderate physical activity you do, the better it is. <laughs> so moderate moderate physical activity is, is 40 to 60% of your maximum heart rate. So the, in last year, 2023, they did a pretty large like a systematic review of the recent studies on exercise and cardiovascular disease risk, cardiovascular disease risk and mortality. And they found that the benefits of vigorous intensity exercise, like HIIT cardio and resistance training, the benefits of that peaked around 140 minutes per week. Whereas the benefits of moderate intensity exercise, you know, the more you did it, the lower the risk was. So you could even do 900, 1,000 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week and the, the lower the risk uh, went. So you know, the more of this hiking, walking, zone two cardio you do, then apparent based on the data, the, the lower the risk of heart disease and uh, the lower the risk of all-cause mortality as well. Whereas with uh, vigorous intensity or you know high intensity exercise, if you do more than 160 minutes, then the benefits start to uh, go away. So you start to see this, you know, U-shaped or a J-shaped curve where not enough exercise or not enough vigorous exercise increases the risk. But after a certain point, you start to get negative gains or you start to reduce the results, um, the benefits. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I, again, we, we kind of know physical exercise is important. And um, yeah, it's, it's great to get that guidance on really the parameters of, of how we want to do it. Uh, the last thing I want to finish on, Seam, and this is one of my my favorite things to do. Why? Because it's great for health, it's good for detoxing, but I want to see if there's a correlation between doing this and longevity, and that is using the sauna. Uh, I know you're a big fan of saunering. Um, is there a connection between people regularly being... I, I've seen that there was a recent study uh, around people in Finland are uh, you know, the happiest in the world and that they, they sauna a lot, but I wonder if there's a connection with longevity so is there is there any connection there from your work and your research around sauna use and longevity yeah so there is quite a lot of epidemiological studies from finland finding that people who take the sauna more frequently have lower heart disease lower dementia lower alzheimer's and lower all-cause mortality as well so the maximum risk reduction is seen with four or more times per week and um, the, like, I guess the counter argument to that would be that it's epidemiological studies and the people who are able to go to the sauna that often and who can afford it, they're like wealthier people. And, you know, mm. the reason 
they live longer and have less of these diseases is because they're rich. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the issue here is that the studies are done in Finland and Finnish or Finland is a massive sauna country. It's part of the cultural identity. Like the population in Finland is 5.5 million, but there are uh, three, three million saunas in the, in, in Finland. So it's almost mm. everyone pretty much has access to the sauna. There's, you know, every gym has a sauna, almost every, almost office building and public saunas everywhere, free, free saunas as well. So, uh, there is access to sauna pretty much across all socioeconomic status. And, um, so it's a, it's a special place to find those results because, you know, yes, in America, if you have a sauna, then first of all, you probably think that it's good for you. And second of all, you can afford it because there's pretty much no public saunas in uh, America. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, that because it's, because it's done in Finland, I think it's a pretty, uh, I think, it certainly is more stronger evidence that there is some causal relationship um, between that. And what they actually f recently found as well was that the frequent sauna use was able to offset some of the harm of low so socioeconomic status on the risk of mortality. So usually people who have lower socioeconomic status, they have a higher mortality risk because of you know not being able to afford healthcare and just having uh, whatever more stress and those kind of things. But in in Finland, they find that the people of lower socioeconomic status, if they take the sauna more often, you know, over four times per week, then they, they have a lower risk of mortality uh, or they can like mitigate the uh, increased risk from low socioeconomic status. And even things like blood pressure and inflammation, the, they find that men who have high inflammation, you know, objective marker, high inflammation, high uh, CRP levels. If they take the sauna over four times a week, then they have the same mortality risk as men who don't take the sauna that often and, ha and they have normal CRP levels. So taking a sauna while having high inflammation gives you the same mortality risk as someone who doesn't have high inflammation but doesn't take the sauna. And uh, similar findings are with the uh, blood pressure as well. So if you have high blood pressure, if you take the sauna, you mitigate the increased risk from having high blood pressure. And there's a lot of like mechanistic reasons for that. The sauna mimics some aspects of exercise. So it's like a very, you know, some, some like it's more than zone one. It's not entirely zone two. So it's, you know, you're like almost like walking in terms of your like speed of heart rate. So it's a low intensity exercise. You, uh, improve endothelial function you have other like let's say benefits for the cardiovascular system you do like excrete some of the different toxins and chemicals as well which you know in the modern world might be more of a issue than in the past mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah there's a lot of like mechanistic reasons why the sauna also has health benefits there's epidemiological data again you can't do these randomized control trials for the long term but uh, i think the evidence from these epidemiological studies is pretty uh, convincing, at least for me. Um, and I am trying to get at least four times a week of uh, taking the sauna. Do you have a sauna at your home or do you, do you go to the gym? How do you, how do you get your sauna time? Uh, I do have it at home. I also have a sauna blanket, uh, okay. so infrared sauna blanket. And uh, yeah, I can, I can use it. Like it heats up pretty pretty fast so the main me like way the sauna has those benefits is through increasing your body temperature so it causes hyperthermia so a mild fever and uh fever is something we associate with sickness but it's actually like a you know a defense mechanism against infections and inflammation so it's or yeah infections and um, pathogens so it's actually like a good thing <laughs> yeah uh, mm -hmm. and this mild hyperthermia has those other mechanistic benefits on the blood vessels on the heart mm. and uh, the brain as well got it so yeah i i have a uh infrared sauna uh in my home as well absolutely love it and yeah it, it's great for detoxing and there's there's so many benefits to it so yeah i want i wanted to get that one in because i i know I, i've seen you do loads of good sauna content before so it's good to get that information for the listeners so this has been great seem um talking about your upcoming book the longevity leap 
Uh, where can our listeners best connect with you and find more out about the book? Yeah, the book is uh, expected to come out like late May or early June. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to be the Longevity Leap on Amazon. If you want to learn more about my content, then I'm on Seam Lund on all the social media platforms. Awesome. Put that in the show notes for the listeners. And Seam, it's been great having you back on, my friend. I think this is the third time we've had you on, so it's, it's been great to reconnect, mate. Sounds good. Well, it's been a pleasure. Wonderful.